that's Mosul out in the distance, right on the horizon there. ISIS is in it. You see the smoke? The first few times we were here, we got shot at a lot by mortars, rockets, machine guns, snipers. If we get shot at, just stay behind the sandbags. If you start dropping mortars, find a bunker. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. States like these constitute an axis of evil. We're seeing history unfold, events that will shape the course of a country, the fate of a people, and potentially the future of the region. end to our combat mission in Iraq. Iraqis have taken full responsibility for their country's security. Daesh is responsible for genocide against Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. Iraq is a place now with 1.8 million displaced people and refugees. 500,000 fled from Sinjak Mountain, Yazidis among them. The Middle East is an ancient land with a complicated narrative. And today, in northern Iraq, the story seems muddier than ever. A modern evil has brought devastation and genocide causing some of its oldest people groups to be on the verge of extinction. My name is Mark Foreman. I'm an author, pastor, and surfer from San Diego, California. For years I've been given the picture of what this place is like. I've listened to the politicians, I've read the headlines, I've always wondered. All these people, all these lives, I can't believe that who they are can be compressed into one headline we get back in New York or LA. So that's why I'm here, to simplify the narrative, to peel back the layers and find out what is the story. Erbil, Iraq. Kurdistan's capital is the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. And brothers Danny and Roni Isak have grown up here. Danny, is it like it was when you were growing yeah. up? When I was a child, it was much better. But now, day by day, it's going worse. So what has changed? The fighting and the things changed the people, changed everything. Life was easier before, from now. It's very complicated and uh, Politics and economic crisis has entered every family. Are the people here the same as when you were growing up? No, for sure no. Uh, many displaced people come to here, and the original people, most of them, they live to European countries or to America. Yeah, to Australia. The Assyrian people yes. left. Yes, good left. Our ancestors, they built this place. That's what makes us to, to stay here. We still 
have the same language, same culture. We feel that we are saving some, something from our past. I born 1988. It was fight between Iraq and Iran. Okay. In 91, there was a fight between uh, Iraq government and Kurdistan. Later, it became fight between people here, brothers, local people, Kurdish. Later, American and other United Nations fight with Saddam. After that, those become Qaeda. Now they came uh, IS. So you're telling me you're 29 and it's hey. been 30 years of war. And uh, war, just war. So, what's the future? It's a very difficult question. Uh. <laughs> Living in this area, and most of who's around you are radicals, is not easy. Maybe after ISIS will come another thing worse than ISIS. We should have our place called Assyria. Talk to me about that. What does a place look like? Our place should be our ancestors' building, Nineveh. Then you want now, to build a state and to be protected and you live there. I am saying for now it's not easy. You think that how many cultures is in the United States, for example? They have the system. Democracy. Democracy and good management the, the, yeah. the country. Everyone is live in peace together. Democracy is not built for those, uh, this area. I don't Until agree now, with him. They thought that some democracy will bring here, that everything will be fine. And what they see, it's a disaster. But it's not the same thing between us. We want something for our nation. But the difference is the way of implementing that. I am saying it's not easy to create and save heaven for Christians and put them all there and you say that we save Christians. It, it sounds to me like you're saying a lot of things that are similar, but... There's some slight differences that you're very passionate about. Two brothers at odds with each other, and so close. The one thing I agree on is that this has been amazing food. <laughs> yeah, you've been an amazing host. I can't thank you enough. With a clear picture of Iraq's recent history and the confusion on how to move forward, I was left wondering how leaders of Iraq plan to recover from this crisis. In Iraqi constitutions, our rights, we have some of rights of, of uh, religion rights and some of the uh, minority rights, but on the ground, there's the big problem. Most of our daughters and sons are leaving Iraq. They are going to, to Europe and America. So you're staying and fighting for something while people are going out the back door and time is ticking. We hope that you and the world, all the world, can do something for us. But we are sure maybe U.S. government, they have a plan to, to finish this tragedy too. But what if, uh, what, if the, what if the U.S. doesn't have a plan? You're the leaders of the Assyrian people and the people want hope. Is there hope in this room? It's too difficult, yes. Sir. It's too painful? Yes, too painful. Iraq has a complex history of different ethnic and religious groups who are well known for their violence towards each other. It's not just ISIS. There's a Sunni fighting the Shia. There's the Kurds fighting the Sunni and Shia. There's a Kurds fighting the Kurds. There's five different countries of Kurds that don't get along.
There's the Kurds against ISIS. There's ISIS against the Free Syrian Army. There's ISIS in the Free Syrian Army. There's the Turks fighting the Kurds with the Free Syrian Army. There's al-Nusra fighting ISIS and everyone else. There's the Arab al-Sham tribe fighting for their own place. All these different wars. So when ISIS crumbles, the problem is not gonna go away. The problem is these different groups being led by hatred, but also by injustice. It's not as simple as, oh, these just bunch of people who like to fight each other. No, there's real injustices they face. And so it's back and forth, vengeance, back and forth, back and forth. We can't sit back there and say, hey, it's your problem. It's our problem. It's a world problem. Cain killed Abel. God asked, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? And I think the rest of the Bible is saying, yes, we are our brother's keeper, not our controller, but our keeper. We're in this with it, these people. They're not that different than us. They've been rescued from Islamic State clutches after suffering horrific abuse. Now, American lawyer Jacqueline Isaac has launched a campaign to get asylum for 100 Yazidi girls who were kidnapped by IS extremists in Syria. I've been to Sinjar Mountain. I've met the girls that have been kidnapped and raped by ISIS. And I'm telling you that we need to give them seeds of hope. The difficulty is that, of course, you're here in an atmosphere in which there's great fear of migrants, refugees, on a huge scale. These are young girls, girls that can be our daughters, girls that can be our sisters. When you start to think of it like that, you're putting a face on the numbers. We needed them. Please help with the program. جو على بيت أبي قالوا يا سلمون يعني طاهم مدة ثلاثة أيام يا راح تسيرون مسلم يا نقتلكم. ISIS then came and knocked on my dad's door and told my dad, you have three days to decide if you're going to be Muslim or not, or we'll kill you. إشتهن كي بق بام بسو ما لا باب قم ما لا باب مهمون هذا السداع جدا. رجع واحد صغير من أيام الرجال قال قتلوا الزلم كلهم الصبع جو أخذوا النسوان هم خمسة وسبعين نسوان كان يعني أمي يعني عمتي يعني بشيء شيء العمر أخذوا من عدنا بالليل جو أخذوا البنات هم من عدنا أخذوني قالوا جو قالوا إلا إن رح نأخذك من عند أمك يا رح نأخذك على المعهد الشرعي يعني تتعلم دروس يعني دوام. شتي مش نقلم برنا حبسة بعد وجدة هشت رجع من حبسة بعد وجدة جماعة سبيع طانة كيف باري ديم داعش النيف ما دت شو ذهات هرجان دي سرت شكت شكو أسبيع ذات اللي سخت يارد كلنا برين. ما كان عندنا شيء لا ألف يعني ما لابس لا أكل لا شيء هي شيء كان هيكل مفتوح يعني لا بي بأبواب لا شبابي كل شيء ما كان بي فتنا بي حديك اللي بيضلينا ثلاث أربعة أشهر ما جيل كده أنا شوشت إنه ما فراق شوشت ما خوارنا وان شيء كل أم قلام كده أم كربنا خدام شبار يعني كان بالبداية أنطونا الدروس عن القرآن والدين يعني ويعني أفكار يعني يقولون مثلا فلان كافر وهذا كافر وراح تسوون هيك يعني أفكار يعني مال قتل كل شيء كان بالماشي نهزمنا ولا كنا 17 نفر واحد من جماعتنا اليزدي كان بنت بجيرانا هي خبر داعش احنا كنا من ناخذ دروس بالمعهد طبعا كنا بيناتهم كان يعني عاقلنا يصير يعني يتغير بس من كنا نرجع البيت كنا يعني نفكر نقول لا طريقتهم يعني غلط ويعني من كنا نشوف اهلنا كنا نقول لا ما يعني ما نصير مثلهم 
هو قتلوا واحد طيارة ضرب على واحد هذا اللي جاء مسؤول علينا و... وهربته ايه نو ما على بابي ما هم استشتكي جن صار لنا داك اخونا بابي اخونا براي اخونا خوش كتخوا ناش غير كتكش ما على بابي من فلتزو خوش كامل This is the land of division, the land of Babel. Yazidis displaced, Kurds against Kurds, Shia against Sunnis, and sometimes even Christian against Christian, divided. Your Holiness, what is the hope for this land? Whom did we write a dia, Bush, Mamriana, Ajazanam, Dot Kabine? دعتت قربة ورخقة خشكان إلي يعني أخنا تخوز كل لايق ومدراسة لي تخوى مرخة أو مشلمان إلي ومشي خالي خشخوى يجانا بنونة خمدي تخاء شو تبو تتخاء كل بدي وخ وشكلة أوي لخشكلة يعني سورة مدوقة من كل أهوال إيو جوترة إنا برد أنا مديانا ويلون هل بالتري أخنواتي من خدا وديتا ويلون أن برشيني أن خدر قل دوخينا شماوة وأوراق ورخقة شهر أمين سي ثايوتة دبار بارغ مهيني In 2005 when I was in Baghdad I asked the driver to take a round in the streets of that neighborhood I always watch the neighbors a Christian woman sitting beside her neighbor Muslim mother and their children playing together You hope that picture will come again. So now we're going to Badr camp. Badr camp is where many of the girls who were rescued but were in ISIS captivity now live. It's pretty amazing. We have this program for them that's totally life-changing and. You know, I just can't explain it. You just have to see it for yourself. Hello. My name is Mark. I love your country. Yes. Hello. How are you? I didn't know I rough. This is Pastor Mark. Say hi, Pastor Mark. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Thank you for having me. Pastor Mark is here from America, yes. from California, oh, and he's here to meet you. I've heard so much about you. We love very, very, very much the course. You love the course. So they learn English over the internet. These are tutors. Yes. Wednesday's group therapy and Saturday's English classes. The first program, uh, I know, uh, I don't know uh, speak and I don't know write, but uh, now I know. <laughs> you speak, you write, and it's kind of a new beginning. Yes, step by step. Hi, Hi. 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 How are you? Yeah, you ready to sing? Yeah. yeah. I have a dream. A song. A song. Violence unmakes the world. It doesn't just beset us, it actually unmakes us. 
Preemptive love is where I jump forward to love you before you love me. I jump forward to trust you before perhaps you've trusted me. But preemptive love unmakes violence. Preemptive love remakes the world through healing. We decided we wanted to be the kind of people who would even serve the child of a would-be terrorist. Because what better way is there to rewrite the narrative that drives terrorism? A few years ago, I envisioned an Iraq where every child had access to the life-saving surgery they needed. Today, we're on pace to accomplish that in the next 10 years. Preemptive love in a place like Iraq has been so known for preemptive wars. Right, this idea that we've got to hit you before you do anything to hurt us. Preemptive love is just this idea that there might be a different way to live. Who did you learn that concept from? Mm -hmm. uh, Leo Tolstoy has a book called The Kingdom of God is Within You. And a lot of it talks about this idea of nonviolence and how to be in the world in a way that is not predicated on struggle. A guy named Derek Webb was singing some songs at that time that asked questions like, how can I kill the one I'm supposed to love? My enemies are men like me. And, you know, as a, as a Christian, these are concepts that I've heard my whole life. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to uh, bless those who harm us or persecute us. But I think my tradition had kind of just pushed that to the side and we didn't really deal with that. This pain didn't begin with ISIS. This is the land of conflict. Who do you blame? Blame inherently continues to pit us against each other. I think um, words like responsibility have the capacity to bring us together a little bit more. So that's one thing. Secondly, um, I'd actually take exception with the idea that this is the land of conflict. This is the land of hope. This is the land of beautiful people. This is the land of progress. This is the land of industry the origin of so many people of belief around the world. So how you frame the problem, how you frame the question can be so determinative in where you end up. You love Christians, you love Muslims, you love Yazidis. Uh, do you love ISIS? We love the people who have found themselves caught up in the ISIS machine, in the ISIS propaganda, in the ISIS mechanizations. Um, saying, do you love ISIS, is actually a little bit like saying, do you love the U.S. Postal Service? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's I mean, an entity. I, I mean, the people, the, the, people, the people that have hurt, that have killed, who have uh, raped, or is, is there actually in you a limit to that love? Absolutely, there's a limit. And I would like to see that limit pushed further and further back. You know, it's easy for me to sit here and say, sure, we love ISIS. On the other hand, if I'm dealing with one guy in front of me, if I can feel that guy's pain, if I can know his story and what drove him into the arms of this ideology or what drove him to those actions, I'm built for empathy. You're built for empathy. We're built to feel the pain of each other. And so if I can peel away the black flags and the masks and, and the rhetoric surrounding ISIS and I can just deal with this guy named Abdullah, I'm much more likely to find a, a place for love and a, a loving response to this guy. Now that doesn't mean he doesn't get punished. It doesn't mean there's no justice. But you can be loving and, and still have a justice system that works. Now this whole idea of preemptive love. We're gonna be the first in and the last to leave. But we don't just wanna show up on the front lines and provide them with something and then pull out. We wanna stick around for the long haul and help them rebuild their communities. We've been bombed, we've been imprisoned, we've been shot at, but we're trying to be a community, a, a movement of people, an organization that says, even when the world is scary as hell, we're gonna love anyway. I like that. In 2014, Collis Barber left his role in the Iraqi parliament to serve as the director of the Shlama Foundation. Today, Collis works to document the current atrocities and to free women and children who were enslaved by ISIS. I understand that there used to be one and a half million Christians here in Iraq, and now there's 
perhaps less than a quarter of a million left, how can you survive in a land where there's been multiple genocide? Before Daesh, uh, it means the period between 2003 till 2014, uh, 126 churches in all of Iraq were attacked. 126 churches be Church. before, before ISIS. Before ISIS. We lost about 1,131 persons. They were killed in all of Iraq, not in Nineveh only. Now that's unique. You're, what you're saying is that uh, once Saddam Hussein was gone, uh, there were over 1,000 Christians killed um, in the period before Daesh. Before Daesh, yes. Wow. And so you weren't safe before Daesh. And I guess the question is, are you safe now? No, uh, till now. Since ISIS invaded Kurdistan, Khalis has documented nearly 13,000 homes and 360 churches that have been destroyed by ISIS. Thank you so much for giving us your time, particularly helping me to understand the numbers. They're just so vast and you've made them so crystal clear. But with all of the data and the numbers, what strikes me is the one. Uh, you would do this for the one. And Rita, you are the one that was rescued. How long uh, were you a slave in Tudash? You don't want your pain to be wasted. You want this message to go to all the women in the world that you're a survivor and they too can be survivors. I think that's a message worth telling. Four weeks ago, you rescued Rita. Why? Why would you risk your life to save these boys and girls from ISIS? بس ما صار أي تحرك دولي من أجل إنقاذهم هذا شيء كواجب إنساني كعلينا ترتب تجاه الإنسانية أو إيش نقول ثاني شيء باتجاه أمتنا من أجل إنقاذهم مرة مرة ثانية ورجعهم عند عوائلهم. They've been held captive. They've been slaves of this ISIS member passed on to another member. These are boys. Sorry. <laughs> These are boys and girls. They've been raped multiple times. Will you be endangered for doing this interview? Pastor Mark, come on over. You've never seen this before. Thanks. Hey, it's an honor to meet you. I've never met anyone quite like Dave Eubank. For the past 20 years, Dave and his family have been living in Burma, assisting those being oppressed by the military dictatorship. Their mantra of free the oppressed has led them to Sudan and now Kurdistan to be with those who are oppressed by ISIS and the soldiers who are fighting for freedom. The sniper right here is shooting at us as we're trying to move people. It is okay. That's the PAK, that's the Kurds from Iran. 
who have joined the fight against ISIS. This is the Peshmerga, the Kurds from here. Mortars land here regularly. You can see there's a divot right there. So you're kind of in the kill zone here, so we won't hang here for a long time. Kill zone, I but like that. The, the ISIS is being pushed back. They're actually shooting less than they have before because they're getting hammered every day by the U.S. air and coalition air. Okay. So this is dentistry. It's dentistry. Ilya, he's the first ranger. He's our wow. chief medic. He's a champion kickboxer of Burma. Wow. Phenomenal soldier, man of God. Saved my life real many times. This is a PAK guy from Iran. Paul, he's our chaplain. And then Toe is our doctor, runs the Jungle School of Medicine in Burma. Why do you come from Burma, Dra? God, he loves us. I want to share this love to other people. I have to say, it was bursting inside of me. All of this is normal, except not on the front lines. I mean, we've all seen missional work, but this is right at hell's edge. This is our life. These are all guys who've been in war since they're tiny. Yeah. And they're serving Jesus, though. All right, so this is the front line itself. You can look out there, that's the town of Bashika. And on that little ridge there, there's a black flag of ISIS flying. There's a dust cloud back there of an ISIS vehicle. Okay. Guns and God don't normally go well together. How do you resolve that in your own life? Well, I love God. He's everywhere. Yeah. So guns don't displace him. Yeah. War doesn't displace him. Hate doesn't displace him. He's all powerful and his love is everywhere. I don't want to just go because it's exciting or I think I can save somebody. I want to go because Jesus sent me as his ambassador to remind people Jesus is alive and present in this world now. Yeah. To heal the brokenhearted, to fix things. He's in the middle of it all and guns and all that don't scare him. Yeah. You're in a foxhole and suddenly with these men, you're under fire. Do you pick up the gun? Well, I have no gun right now. Yeah. If I have no gun, I put my Bible in my pocket and I pray and I take photos and I treat any wounded or help move wounded to our medics. That's what I do. If they keep shooting and a gun's available, I pray, God, should I use it or not? Most of the time, I don't shoot. Most of the time, I don't fight. I want to fight all the time. <laughs> I really do. But it's not the role God's given me. I, for myself, I would rather have someone like you who hasn't figured out that theology than someone that's making no difference in the world. It's all coloring inside the lines with a tight theology and making no difference. So thank you for <laughs> being crazy, man. <laughs> Even soldiers don't travel with their children. There's gotta be a reason why you would bring your children to be a part of what you do right here in harm's way. Well, when our kids were born, the Karen villagers in Burma, whose villagers are burned, whose own children are killed, who run all the time, they said, you have kids, bring them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, 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 we're Americans. We, our kids can't dare be in the situation. No, man, God made us all the same. Yeah. And so we've noticed too, like in Syria, when they saw us, they see a lot of guys like me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know? They see a kid, they're like, whoa. And in Sudan, the Sudanese leader in Nuba Mountain said, we know you love us as much as anything else because you brought your kids. We'll give you everything. And when I came to Kurdistan the first time, I met the Minister of Defense and he said, who's that boy? My son, your son. You brought your most precious thing. I give you my most precious thing, my country. You go anywhere you want. So we're at the tail end of the program. Yeah. So, How cool. Yeah. How many kids are here? There's about 100, probably 200. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, it's from like three different villages, Christian villages in this area. But this is the only school that has reopened. So they all joined this school. So the father here is the pastor oh. over the school and the church. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love you. This guy organizes all the programs here with Karen. And this is Deloa. He's uh, helping us translate and understand things. Hello. He is a Muslim Kurd. Okay. Yeah, we pray together all the time. Yeah. Phenomenal guy. The whole reason why I started this program is that desire to give something that's eternal. There is a last moment for us. And what do we give kids that may be their last moment? And for these kids, it's a, a small gift for something that is in the face of a big problem. We don't know what's gonna come the next day, the next moment, tomorrow, for either of us, but you try to stay a step ahead and pour that joy in. In the Bible, it, I don't know of any or many places that say, be safe, right. 
God is always saying, do not be afraid. Go, have I not told you? No, don't be afraid, go. Jesus never said, hey, make sure you're safe, Christians. Go, but go in love. My message to the American church and to myself is Jesus first, obey him. Don't be led by comfort or fear. That's never a leader. Those are, those are things you look at, but they don't lead you. They're the context of what you're gonna do. Trust God for the comforts you need. Trust God to protect you. And we got heaven forever. Now, use your life, man, spend it. The battle for Mosul lasted nearly a year, with both Kurdish and Iraqi forces working together to eliminate ISIS. Now that ISIS is removed from the city, I'm left wondering if the refugees will ever return to the region. believe we're standing up here. Uh, we were in a bunker last time, hi there. hiding from ISIS. Mosul's liberated. I expected to come into Mosul and see Flowers great, great and joy in the city and dancing. And instead, I see the front lines all over again, different players, and we're, we're back, back here again. Where they started. And I felt like you just hit a home run, but then suddenly you find yourself back at first base. You've done everything, you got no score, and you're back at first base. Go, wait a minute. I just hit a home run. No, it didn't count. What is that? And, and I don't think we've had that in the American experience. Is there any hope? I lost a lot of friends in there, a lot of Iraqi friends. I lost my translator, Shaheen. I, I think you met him last time. He died in Mosul. I'm sorry. This underlying hate all through here that even though um, people united against this just visible evil of ISIS, um, there's not enough love. They've all got a reason to hate and fight each other. They're not crazy people. They've all got a reason. How do you change it? Something about the name of Jesus. That's the only hope. Yeah. And when we walk with Jesus' love and in his name, we actually don't have to win. <laughs> we just walk in it, and if we lose, we die before we see justice. It's okay. He's been with us and he's touched people. I think that's the only hope. And you can't, God doesn't force it, we can't force it, but we can try to live it ourselves. And if God sends us here to go.
Dr. Bayar is a professor at the American University of Kurdistan and considered one of the leading experts on the Kurdish people, including the religious minorities that call Kurdistan home. When I was here a year ago, we went to the front lines, and from the front lines, I looked down on Mosul and I saw the ISIS flag flying. This time I saw something I never thought I'd see. I, the front lines were the Kurdish flag flying and protecting Kurdish land from the Iraqi flag. Right. Is Kurdistan going to disappear? I think there will be a big massacres, there will be a big genocide because Kurds will defend themselves, you know. In following 10 years, we will totally lose them. In 10 Kurdish years, maybe less, from... than, maybe less than 10 years. I think so. I can see that you really are a historian. Yeah, I interest in history. Oh, yeah. This is it. Wow. Yeah, she's my Margaret George. She was a Christian Peshmerga. So a, a Christian female yeah. Peshmerga yeah. in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, and she was very brave. She actually looks a lot like my mother <laughs> when she was young. You know, in George Washington University, there was a very nice lady from uh, Canada. She wrote her dissertation on a species of, of a fish, and it was really impressive presentation. I came from an area we are struggling to, to rescue people, and a, a, a risk much bigger than the risk that these kind of fishes uh, face. It. So you're saying that the uh, minorities here are an endangered species? Absolutely, absolutely. You didn't paint a pretty picture. What is the future of yeah. minorities? I think they don't have any future. No future. Unfortunately, I don't think there is a future. Dr. Nazar currently serves as the Director General of Health in Iraq and has single-handedly opened the door for people like Jacqueline Isaac and Dave Eubank to work in the region. People speak of a safe zone and they speak of ending the process of genocide, but now minorities are still leaving the country and not feeling safe. Is there any hope here in the land? If you look at the evidence, yes, you are right, that people are leaving, still there is tension, there is war ongoing, but there is hope. And if you go to the history and look uh, to Kurt as an example, we were exposed to chemical bombarding, we were exposed to mass displacement, mass escape, and, and then we are still here. And we survived, and you see us now sitting in the hook, and we are doing this interview. You have four children, lovely wife. How safe do you feel personally? And have you ever thought of leaving this region for safety? I believe to stay and serve my people here. And many times maybe you will have pressure from the family that you should go out and you should make a better life for your family, especially if you are competent enough. But the competent people and the older brains should stay here and serve the people here. What do you love most about your country? I love my people. They are very simple and humble, you know? I've seen that on the streets. They love even the stranger if they don't know them, but they love them. It would not happen in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that there's tensions here beyond ISIS, but the issues remain. It's either no hope or an incredible hopeful story and nothing in between. And obviously, I like your hope. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Nazar. Much. Excuse me, hello. Uh, excuse me. 
Hi, man. Hey. How are you? Good to see you. You want to go with people? Yeah, upstairs? Yes, <laughs> all right. The Christian, now, they want to be away from pain. Where's happiness? Where's the joy? Jesus never promised us that you're going to have prosper life, wealthy and healthy life, all our life. He was going to provide everything that we need, but there's always persecution if you live for him, and there's pain. Each weekend, Pastor Kassan's church opens its doors to 600 families of all faiths who have been displaced by the current conflict. All told, the church feeds 6,000 families every 10 weeks. So they get a sermon every time that they yes. come here. But they don't feel any, any pressure to no. respond. No. Or, yeah. no. It's up to them. Some of them, they want to sit there. Some of them, they sit inside. Some, they say outside. They don't want to listen. We don't force them. If we learn how to live in that pain with Jesus Christ, then the world will going to ask us, why you have still have joy in your life, then you can tell them about Jesus. Have you experienced pushback from what you're doing? Uh, not everyone is happy with this message. We visited the front lines and we met a general there. And we were talking about ISIS and the, the thoughts that they, have, they are having. So I opened Matthew and I start to read to him the word of Christ when he's saying, love your enemies and pray for people who are persecuting you. And after listening to this message, he said, you Christian have a big responsibility because you need to share what you have with other people to understand the true meaning of forgiveness. And this was a, a Muslim general yes. encouraging you yes. as a Christian yes. that this is the message everyone needs to hear. Yes. Many times under tragedy, people will unite that are at least of like mind and I've not seen the unity among Christians that I might have expected. Do you see unity? The spirit of division works very hard. That's why we help everyone. We don't look at denomination or religion. We help people. If he's from different religion, we help him as a human being. If he's from a different denomination, we help him as a brother in Christianity. The church now, if you talk to people, they say church is Chaldean, Assyrian, Syriac people. This is the church in Iraq or Armenian. But I see the future church will going to be Arabs from Sunni and Shia background and also Kurdish people. This will be the future church of Iraq. This is how I see it. So there's still hope for this country. You and I are standing just a mile away from the Syrian border, maybe 15 miles from Mount Sinjar, and it was villages just like this one that were destroyed by ISIS. This evidence, like what you see here, yeah. has to be preserved, and it's the responsibility of the entire world to make sure that it's preserved. The days of the Holocaust, one of the reasons that it continued as long as it did was because people just didn't know what was happening. Yeah. Awareness is key to stop this injustice, not just for them, but for, for all of us, for generations to come. What does that look like for this land here? What is justice? It's a hope that one day I can start again. I can trust my neighbor who I believe betrayed me. I can believe that there's a future for my generation to come, not to be always afraid that it could happen to my daughter, that history can repeat itself. I really think that one day our children, our grandchildren, they're gonna be studying what happened in history books, and they're gonna ask, well, what did you do? I hope we have an answer for it. Jacqueline is right. Our kids will ask us, what did you do? I guess that's the question. 
I came to Iraq looking for answers, and I met a question that has yet to be answered. I know for me, retelling their story is one thing I can do. These are stories that could change how we live in our world. Religious freedom is something I take for granted until I see what life is like without it. Living close to and loving those who are being persecuted changes my perspective and it makes my faith more valuable. But choosing to stand with those who want this freedom is a decision I want to make. I came to Iraq to bring some closure to the openness and messiness of the story. I leave with things as messy as ever. I thought I might help those persecuted, but instead, they have changed me. There are still questions to be answered. Will the refugees ever return to the region? Will a safe zone or Kurdish independence solve the problem? And will the world soon forget this genocide?